In this lecture, we will discuss staffing and scheduling, as well as selecting, developing, and appraising nursing staff. Let's review the objectives of this session in the next slide. By the end of this session, you should be able to identify the budget preparation process for healthcare organizations, integrate current research into principles to effectively manage nursing staff, and analyze scheduling issues that impact the matching of nursing resources to patient needs. In this part of the lecture that is related to staffing and scheduling, I'm going to use a case study and scenario. First, let's review some of the terms that are relevant to productivity. NHPPD is nursing hours per patient day. ULS is unit of service. ADC, average daily census. FTE, full-time equivalent. There are other tools related to budget preparation, and these include productivity management reports, budget variance reconciliation, and corrective action plans. Staffing principles include staffing plans, defining targets based on nursing hours per patient day and unit of service, patient classification, outcome analysis, models of care. Our case study is that you are a manager of an adult medical telemetry unit. Your budget for next year is an average daily census of 40. Nursing hours per patient day is 8.79. RN to patient ratio, 1 to 4. And total FTEs, 61.7. Because of renovation on the unit, your average daily census has been running between 28 and 32. The renovation is scheduled for at least six more weeks. Your staff is being floated to other units, and frustration is beginning to show. Staff are calling in, and your care model is eroding because you are having difficulty maintaining your RM to patient ratio. The solution to this will be that a staff scheduling council meeting is called for an emergency meeting. The maximum average daily sentence is determined to be 32 for the next six weeks. The council seeks to remove frustrations to the staff and return to the care model that supports their patient care delivery. And units that staff have been floating to are contacted for their projected needs. Retention is important for staffing and staff satisfaction. Uh, it has a direct impact on, it, on satisfaction, as well as the cost to the organization, and an impact on care and collaboration. Patient outcomes is also important, as well as staffing strategies, and these strategies can include floating, mandatory overtime, and planned reassignment. Staffing and patient outcomes um, has been identified through various resources. Um, there is definitely a relationship between staffing, level of staff, and patient outcomes, and these um, resources have identified that in the Joint Commission Staffing Effective Standards, the American Nurses Association Principles for Nurse Staffing, and the National Database for Nursing Quality Indicators. A review of the literature and a literature search will also show the um, correlation between staffing and patient outcomes. The Joint Commission has initiated an effort to begin correlating an organizational clinical outcome data with its staffing ratios to determine the effectiveness of the overall staffing plan. There are clinical service and human resource indicators that are used together um, to assess staffing effectiveness. The clinical service indicators would be things like patient fall, skin breakdown, and length of stay. The human resource indicators would be the nursing hours per patient day, overtime, and vacancy rates. So for our case study, the length of stay was compared with overall nursing hours per patient day and the percentage of those care hours that was filled by the RN. When the nursing hours per patient day were more than nine and the percentage of RN was less than 60%, length of stay was extended. Data were used to 
to budget a staffing model to bring nursing hours per patient day to 8.5 and the RN as percentage of care hour to more than 60%, which resulted in a length of stay of less than four days. If the quality care of care is dependent on the quality and talent of staff, selecting, developing, and evaluating staff is a critical process. This is a key responsibility of managers and involves staff input in critical ways. What we will learn here will answer some questions about why position descriptions are important, how to screen and select staff, what to expect from coaching strategies, how to appraise or participate in appraisal. This information puts the idea of selecting, developing, and evaluating staff in a context of role theory. Role theory has five components. First is role acquisition, and this refers to how one takes on a new role. This aspect focuses on how to perform and what is expected. Role clarity refers to distinguishing the role from that of others. This aspect of role development refers to such tasks as seeing how the role of a staff nurse in a hospital A differs from the role of a staff nurse in hospital B. It can also relate to what differences exist between serving as a charge nurse as opposed to a staff nurse or nurse manager. Many people think of this aspect as a clarification of whose job is what. Role performance relates to how the role is actually enacted. The legal and organizational parameters are established by law and the employer, but the insight of the role derives from the individual. So, when differences of opinion arise between two staff members about what to do next or how to approach a problem, in part, the differences may derive from how an individual believes he or she must perform his or her role. Another aspect of role development is ambiguity. In this situation, individuals do not have a clear understanding of what is expected of their performance or how they will be evaluated. Lack of clarity is frustrating in most situations, and especially so in a work setting. Role conflict is easier to recognize. Employees know what is expected of them, but they are either unwilling or unable to meet the requirements. All of these comments about role theory are equally important for managers and followers. If anyone on the team is confused, the possibility exists that others may also become confused. To avoid role issues, select your staff wisely, develop staff consistently, and evaluate staff fairly. Acquisition of a role is fairly time intensive. The role of the manager and other staff, or in the case of a new manager, all of the staff, is to be open and honest about how the role is seen and whether or not the performance matches the expectation. Two critical points about position descriptions are these. Position descriptions must reflect current practice guidelines. Position descriptions beyond your need need to be understood. Selecting staff, developing staff, and evaluating staff. Position descriptions have to be analyzed on a regular basis to be sure they reflect what is accurate for practice expectations. If they aren't reviewed on a regular basis, they must at least be reviewed prior to opening a position for applicants. Advertising one thing and then really expecting another puts the organization at risk. Irrespective of what position you hold, you need to understand position descriptions beyond your own to be sure that you are working appropriately within the full context of positions, and especially that you are delegating properly. Position descriptions play an important role in each of the key areas of selecting, developing, and evaluating staff. As already stated, position descriptions must be reviewed prior to seeking applicants for a position. There should be a set of standard questions that are used with all applicants, and these questions should derive from the position description. The purpose, of course, is that interviewees be able to garner information that can be compared across candidates to determine the best fit of an applicant with the available position. In developing staff, position descriptions serve to guide the educational efforts. 
In other words, if an individual is insufficient in performing the expectations of the role, those discrepancies, if educational in nature, form the basis for a remediation program. If these insufficiencies emerge due to changes in the set of position descriptions, the discrepancies form the basis for a reorientation to the role type or program. If an individual is changing position, the differences between the two position descriptions indicate where coaching or professional development needs to be geared. Evaluating staff obviously has to be based on a common understanding of what performances should be. Again, position descriptions form the basis for determining how able an individual is in meeting expected stated expectations. If, for example, a group of nurses is not meeting a particular expectation, the manager must ask if there was an institutional failure to make clear what was expected or if there was some disincentive to perform the role function. The manager should also consider if some change occurred that basically caused the position description to be outdated. Each of these areas requires that the manager be actively engaged in coaching. As you can see, coaching is about developing individuals within an organization. It really can start in a simplistic manner during a selection process or an evaluation process, but its biggest impact and greatest energy focus on the development phase of staff. Many of us think about coaching through what we see in sports. That is almost always evident in team sports. However, sports of individuals, such as golf or racing, also include coaching. Similarly, a leading leader might engage in coaching a team about a new way to deliver care or about how to address a unit issue. That is appropriate when the issue or goal involves a team. When the goal or issue relates to only one person, however, coaching becomes very individualized. It is a didactic relationship that focuses on one person providing feedback in a way to coach the recipient into new ways of performing. Because coaching is a learned behavior, we can all become coaches. The challenge is that coaching is not a quick fix strategy, so sufficient time and effort must be devoted to it.